they looked at the adults 35 years later. The people that were the most independent and successful and self-actualized were the ones that were super loved by their mothers. Mm. Okay. Now, and they, and and the, and the conclusion of the researchers was you can't love children too much. What he's talking about is attachment theory. Hi everyone and welcome to the Green Lab Code. If you're a parent, have a little one on the way, or have a full grown adult, you've come to the right place. Because this video is all about attachment theory, different parenting styles, and other dynamics that have been researched, but haven't made their way to the forefront yet. So we'll also be looking at the four attachment styles kind of scattered throughout the video. So if you're ready, I'm definitely ready. Let's get started. We see it all the time. Babies, monkeys, and young calves, young gorillas, and human babies crave being in closeness with their mothers. In the US, skin to skin is common practice after a baby is born, immediately placing the child on the mother's breast, so to prioritize the touching even more than the feeding. Now, many cultures believe that a baby won't actually survive without physical contact. And John Bobley, the creator of attachment theory, seems to second this. Around six to eight weeks, babies begin to show preferences with the primary caregivers, and even secondary caregivers. And at seven to 11 months, it gets kicked up another notch, making the primary caregiver truly wanted and needed. Now, attachment theory asks the question, is the attachment figure nearby, accessible and attentive? So seven to 11 months is a long time already for a baby to be here on earth. And it's a sensitive time as well. So if proximity, accessibility and attentiveness aren't met, they experience anxiety and they experience distress. And this can be seen with a simple glancing around the room looking for their caregivers or a more extreme version where they're crying and screaming. Now, John Bowlby, the creator of attachment theory, observed that feeding them alone wasn't enough. When that feeding was paired with close proximity, the babies actually experienced calmness and the anxiety seemed to go away. Now, in conjunction with this, it mattered how fast the caregiver responds and how consistent they were at doing so. By being quick to satisfy the baby's needs, that detrimental factor of building trust is there. It's vital and it affects a child-parent dynamic for life. Now, if you're catching on, you'll understand that there's a window for this. That small amount of time we have to get right. Because attachment theory believes that this gift of security that we give our children can only be given during that critical period of development, which experts say is usually three years. Now, not to say this is irreversible, but once that window passes, the relationships that are formed during that period, whether they are good or bad, tend to remain relatively unchanged for the rest of the person's life. Gaber May has a background in family practice with a special interest in childhood development, trauma, and addiction. Now, I had posted a remix of one of his reels on my Instagram, and it has 10K, I believe so, likes as of now, and it just keeps getting more and more traction. Now, he is highly sought after as a guest speaker for his findings after years of research, and he exhibits a very modern day type of thinking. He believes that by treating the time we spend with our kids as a gift, something to be so highly cherished every single time, so that the child can feel this way and feel invited and accepted, we are setting them up for success in a way that the world has never known before. Now, it also makes it easier to discipline them because according to Mate, if we wanna punish our kids, we first have to make them our disciples. And that's because our disciples aren't afraid of us. Now, if you've ever felt like you're waiting for the right time or you're waiting until they get older so you have something to talk about with them, you're already messing up as a parent. And the lesson of happiness is the best gift that we can give them. Now, in Western societies, money and status make us successful. But in the works of Gaber Mate, success comes from our inner selves. Now, when we look at the German style of parenting or maybe even like the Russian style of parenting, Many of those children grow up to be tough as nails. They are resilient as ever, but many of them have a reputation for being a little bit cold, a little bit heartless. And communication with their parents during adulthood can be very little to non-existent. And this is basically due to them getting very little affection and love as a child. This isn't always the case, but it happens a lot. In the same way, if a child grows up in a toxic home where rage and yelling is a constant thing, that parent isn't a place to give his child the best attention or the best form of attachment. They then start seeking it in their peers. And this is because the brain can't handle not having a bond. But according to Mate, once we lose that authoritarian power over our kids, it's so hard to get it back. And finding attachment in peers may mean finding friends that are just as traumatized as they are. While this may seem comforting to them, it can also be a result of truancy, gangs, skipping school, and even drugs. 
Now, this is a more extreme scenario, but even subtle versions like a child not getting enough attention have led to similar things. So it kind of goes to show just how important that is. Now, I want to talk about a story that exemplifies this in a very interesting way. Jack Barsky is known as the ex-Russian spy who was living the American dream. Now, after showing great potential as a KGB spy, they sent him over to the US on an undercover assignment most KGB spies dream of. Now, the catch here is that he ended up turning on his own people. After a while, he got married and started a family behind the KGB's back in the USA. And in 1988, after 10 years of living here, he got the call to come back to Russia due to fear of being discovered. Now, he was starting to think that this call would never come. At this point, he couldn't fathom leaving his little girl behind. So he chose this family instead of the first family he had in Germany where he was born. Now, this story is going to demonstrate just how detached Jack Barsky was in relationships compared to most people. Now, when Jack first came to the States, he was married and had a baby boy and the relationships actually overlapped and the KGB would send him back to Germany every two years to visit his family. But unfortunately, according to him, he failed to find any connection at all with his son. And this could have been due to long distance, but it also could have been due to his childhood. Now, after pondering for about a week or so on whether to leave his new daughter and wife, he decided to stay. He wrote a letter to the KGB telling them that he had contracted AIDS during the epidemic and that he would disappear quietly. Now, his family back home, including his mom, brother, wife, and son, all got the news that he died of AIDS and they never heard from him again. Now, the story is quite remarkable. And years later, he ended up reconnecting with his son thanks to his daughter looking him up on the internet. As far as his mom, however, she cried herself to sleep every night thinking that her son had died from AIDS. Now, Jack Barsky's brother apparently never forgave him for this once he found out that he was still alive. On the other hand, Jack Barsky had few regrets. He says, quote, it sounds cruel, but she set herself up for what happened. In a relationship between a parent and a child, the emotions must be seeded by the parent. There were never hugs. I would probably come across more sympathetic if I said something else, but there's just nothing there. No emotions, unquote. Jack Barsky's attachment style is a perfect example of dismissive avoidant. One of four attachment styles created by John Bowley after doing a study on babies and their interactions with their mothers. Now, this is one to be concerned about. While other babies were at the age where preference of caregivers was high, these babies showed no preferences and even avoided or looked away when their primary caregivers came in. Because this isn't natural, it's believed that these babies could have been victims of abuse or neglect. They eventually learn to stop asking for help in childhood and in adulthood. They're able to turn off their feelings and can be extremely independent and push themselves away from being vulnerable. But real quickly, before we continue, if you found any value in this video so far, I'd greatly appreciate it if you'd hit the like button to help the algorithm. And if you enjoy videos on the environment, exposing of different industries, and mental health, subscribe for more. Now, another thing that can happen is a child develops PTSD, ADHD, anxiety, depression, but it's all due to stress. Now, Gabermate's findings were that wherever there was mental illness, physical stress, or addiction, it stemmed from early childhood trauma. Now, most of the time, it was the toxic styles of the parents that resulted into these implications. A child repressing anger after being born into a household where crying's not allowed, whining's not allowed, is one example. Throw a tantrum and get things taken away or get beat. Now, a child's coping mechanisms aren't developed. There's going to be times when they get naughty. Now, discipline is okay, but instilling fear is never the answer. And additionally, minimizing a child's feelings and not letting them express their feelings is one of the worst things that we can do as parents as the long-term consequences lead to internal battles. Now, studies have actually shown that repressing anger weakens the immune system. Now, in Gaber Mate's own words, quote, when there's loss emotionally, it transfers into biology, unquote. So this can literally make us sick. Now, this also brings me to the defects in American and Western societies, as well as other countries in basically helping aid in a young child's trauma even more. People who are obese are more likely to get COVID, right? Yes. But who gets obese? People who are abused. Yeah. Yeah. And why are they eating too much? To cover up their feelings. Exactly. Yeah. So it's all connected. But what's happening is that, number one, people are more and more isolated, more and more stressed. Now they eat to soothe, to soothe the stress. The sugar companies will come along and say, well, have this food. It'll make mm. you feel better. The, the system yeah. works elegantly. Now, we see the rates in a child's mental illness increase every single year, consistently. 
We ask, what's the solution instead of how do we prevent? We say, take this medication and we're now separating the mind from the body rather than them being one. No prevention, but always medication. Now today, there's millions and millions of children on stimulant medications for ADHD, antipsychotic medications, and more. Now, because we don't know how to regulate these things, doctors give them something to change the chemistry on the brain, and now the child are dependent on them. Now, it definitely feels like 30 years from now, three quarters, and definitely more than half of the young adult population are going to be on meds when a lot of them didn't need to be. This brings me to two other attachment styles. Now, preoccupied attachment is having a mix of many different emotions. These babies seem more confused than anything, displaying disorientation and being dazed. Now, they didn't show preference to any caregiver and even resisted them. Similar to anxious avoidant, it was assumed that consistency with the parents could be lacking, or was even theorized that the parents could play both the role of the comforter, but also added fear leading to the confusion in the baby. Now, in adulthood, they can be very up and down, being in love with love, preferring fantasy to reality, clingy, demanding, and attracted to partners that can save them or that they can save. Unhealthy boundaries are also common, and if I had to choose one person that is well known that really reminds me of this attachment style the most, I would definitely say Britney Spears. Third is fearful avoidant or disorganized avoidant. Now, the behavior seen in these babies are that of distress stemming from minimal parental attention and more than likely one parent exhibiting frightening behavior. Now, they can't depend on their parents to be there and usually freak out when they leave. They may start to approach the parent for comfort, but then they very quickly withdraw. Now, this attachment style didn't get added to the original three category model until three years later in 1990. It affects around 70 to 15% of people, US children and in adulthood, they can end up in abusive relationships, they have highs and lows, inner conflicts, abandonment issues, they're unpredictable, and have a fear of getting too close. Now, before we reveal the final attachment style, we're gonna go into two parenting types that have been considered to be the best. Now, attachment theory says you either have it right the first years or you don't have it right ever. While parenting styles focus on the entirety of the time before a child reaches adulthood, so what I learned was that both theories honestly complement each other because most mothers and fathers who are very affectionate and doting were very likely to adopt gentle or authoritative parenting styles. Now with gentle parenting, people are very divided on this topic and the name alone seems to strike a chord with many people. And that's because people confuse this with permissive parenting where there's no belief in discipline, boundaries, or hardly any rules. Now, if we're being honest, Permissive parenting has pretty low expectations of a child, and children have actually shown to struggle academically. But gentle parenting is different. It seeks to form the strongest connection possible to the child while applying age-appropriate tactics. Now, this can mean supporting a child when they're upset or setting boundaries when they've been in the wrong. Now, the technique also wants parents to empathize with the child because it's the only way to truly understand them. Now, parents who are impatient or very busy will have an especially difficult time training themselves as it requires humility and not being rushed. And obviously in this day and age, it's very hard not to be rushed. So I believe it would be hard for a lot of parents, but definitely worth it. Now it's definitely a process, but like Alison Andrews, a psychologist in the field says, quote, when we show gentleness, especially during stressful times, we model frustration tolerance and we model flexibility. Staying calm and being gentle and firm sets the tone for positive growth and development, unquote. So even though it takes time, parents and children reap the rewards when the child is older. The next ideal parenting strategy is authoritative parenting, and it's one of the original four styles of parenting. It's very similar to gentle parenting, but leaves more room for regulation, and with gentle parenting, timeouts and groundings are actually discouraged. Yes, in fact, gentle parenting believes that kids aren't yet wired for compliance and self-control, which is why parents should instead show patience with our fully developed brains. But nevertheless, the research has shown that kids of authoritative parenting styles are more likely to become responsible adults who feel comfortable self-advocating and express their opinions and feelings. So this is a good thing, right? Now, for the sake of letting parents choose their own parenting style, I've provided both of the best techniques so parents could figure out which style best suits their child's needs as each child is so different. Additionally, both techniques seem to intertwine with attachment theory as aiming to connect at a high level is priority. Finally, I wanna talk about parents parenting themselves. 
Now, Dr. Shafali is a psychologist and author and has been everywhere in the last few years due to high demand for her ideology called conscious parenting. However, public opinion is 50-50. And if you're wondering, I actually couldn't find her success rate, but I think people seek her out for a reason. Although she touches on the subject of parenting, her main focus is for the parents to forget everything they know, unmask the layers of what society, our parents, our cultures and backgrounds have taught us, and for the parents to almost treat themselves like they're new to the world, a sponge ready to soak up everything. In other words, completely let go of our egos. Now, attachment theory talks a lot about love and connection, but based on the views of Dr. Shefali, this love would still be conditional. And this isn't in her own words, it's just something I kind of connected. And this is even with our children. Now, our way of parenting may in fact be amazing, but if we tell them everything we believe in that they should too, it's like we're saying to them, according to Dr. Shefali, if you have this status, achieve these things, live this lifestyle and have these beliefs, I will love you more. And I haven't met one parent who doesn't have this bias. Women want their daughters to be thin and dress pretty, to impress their own adult friends. While many dads aspire strong athletic boys. Now, what many people seem to miss is that children come into this world ready for it and already teaching us how to be. They're playing saying, hey, look at me, accept me for me. But we want great, fanciful, well-mannered with a master's degree. But by doing this, it makes it hard for a child to accept themselves. And even children who come from stable homes struggle with this greatly when this pressure is put on them. I am trying to get you to live my dream. This was not your dream. You went all the way back yeah. to that, that mother yeah. who only longed for the best for her child. Mm -hmm. But you, because you had a moment of awareness and your ego was reined in, mm -hmm. you went, maybe it was me? Absolutely. Who just set her on the wrong path? Absolutely. Sent her on to the slaughterhouse of yeah. her spirit? Makes me want to cry because <sighs> I did that. But you helped me to see that that's what I was doing. Now, since all parents have been conditioned, some way, somehow, change is scary. As human beings, we're not naturally wired to love unconditionally. And to implement this properly, we invite tantrums, messes, crying, emotions of all kinds, as well as growing with the child to achieve inner freedom. We have to keep in mind that a child who is in second grade isn't the same child as when they are in fifth grade. So it's very important to grow with the child. But don't worry, this method still believes in boundaries. Now, when children ask life's biggest questions is where it gets touchy for a lot of parents. Religion, family ideas, marriage, what is success, what are morals? Now, this doesn't mean that they won't turn out how we want them to. If we model, like Shefali advises instead of telling, and the child can see the parent is truly happy in doing what they preach, it's very likely that the child will follow suit and have similar or the same beliefs. But we can also start off with saying, I personally believe instead of this is what it is when our child asks us of life's biggest questions. That way they feel like they got to that conclusion on their own. Now in her own words, quote, love without consciousness becomes need, dependency, control in the name of love, unquote. Now if children had the ability this entire time to fully accept themselves, yet it got pushed off until they were in their mid twenties, then maybe we did something wrong. And to quote her once more, quote, it's narcissistic to think that we can raise a kid when we haven't even raised ourselves, unquote. So the key points to take away from conscious parenting is the six myths, AKA what good parenting isn't. Parenting is about the child. A successful child is ahead of the curve. There are good kids and bad kids. Good parents are natural and loving. Good parenting is about raising a happy child. Good parents are in control. Now, this brings me into the last attachment style, and that's none other than secure attachment. Now, secure children may cry when their parent leaves, but seem more assured and trust in the parent to come back. And any instance of sadness or fear, they cling to the parent for support. In adulthood, this person is optimistic in love, trusting, and they therefore give his or her partner autonomy to be themselves, as well as giving them their own space. Although they may have bad days, their emotional intelligence is high, so they're able to communicate with their partner in a very mature way, which results in the couple usually growing. Now, more than that, they're able to seek out partners that have the same attachment style as them. If we were to put everything we learned together, one would think, let's just be gentle or authoritative parents who shower our children with love and at the same time are ever working on ourselves. If one thing is certain, we have the first three years to really get it right. Now, I wanna hear from you. I wanna hear your thoughts. What's your view on what you heard and what do you think of this new age style of parenting? Leave a comment down below. 
it's narcissistic oh my gosh okay i've provided i've provided i've provided okay 